All right, welcome. Thank you for braving the storm for coming, and welcome to our online audience. It's a real pleasure to welcome back Jin Chung Lee to the department. Uh, a number of you will remember her from her graduate student days here. So Jin Chung has always been an overachiever. Uh, she, uh, as an undergraduate at uh, Capital Normal University in Beijing, she uh, published two papers describing new species of cave crustaceans. Uh, and at the same time, she took a year off and published a thesis in biochemistry in Tübingen in Germany, all while an undergrad. We were very lucky enough to, to attract her to our program, uh, and I was looking at her CV again this morning, and good Lord, uh, you published about 10 papers from your time as a grad student here, from work start, uh, done during that period, which is quite remarkable. Recording in progress. Thank you. And um, a, as she finished her PhD, she um, uh, obtained an NSF postdoc, Ocean Sciences Fellowship, and worked with uh, Colin Kavanagh, an expert in um, marine chemobiosynthesis, uh, chemo, chemo uh, symbiosis, excuse me, um, for two years. And then she um, got a job at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where she's been uh, f for the past few years. She's an assistant professor and also a curator of inverts in the Museum of Natural History. So uh, without further ado, let, let's get started. So the title of her talk is Light and Dark Side of the Force, Marine Bivalve Algal Photosymbiosis in Light Gradients. Thanks, Dermot. So how can I make the <laughs> thing appear on the screen first? <laughs> yeah, no worries. I haven't given an in-person seminar in like three years, so we're all forgetting how to do any of this in-person stuff. Actually, I might also actually change to a different stack. Do you actually see my actually why? Because this is the kind of oh, okay. oh it's not the way. Yeah. It's doing something on my side. There, right. it shows up. Do you want better? Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey. Thank you so much. Do we need to turn down the light a bit or now it's green again. <laughs> oh, there. Great. Well, thank you so much. I mean, thank you for coming in person in the snow. Like I said, we haven't done this for a while, so we're trying to get back to it. Um, yeah, like Dermot said, I've spent many years sitting on the other side of the audience, and now I'm very honored to be on this side <laughs> of the seminar, so, so let's get started. Well, if you look at the title, you probably get I'm a fan of Star Wars, so when I'm working on my system, I'm always thinking about the dark and light side of evolution. So we'll start with the light side, and then we'll gradually go to the dark. Okay. So speaking of light, my photosynthesis is really a fundamental process in our ecosystem and in a human society as well. If you think about it, our food, commodity, fuel, material, they're really ultimately the product of photosynthesis. But as heterotrophic organisms ourselves, we're actually now very efficient in utilizing the solar power and convert them into organic carbon ourselves. Right? So one day I was sitting in my house and looking at my neighbors installing solar panels because there's a lot of sun in Colorado, <laughs> in case you don't know. So I thought about, well, how much space do I need to install these many solar panels to be entirely self-sustainable? Right? So I did a little bit of research. I found this little obscure website. And it says for a household of four, which is about 186 square meters of space, you need an additional 8,000 square meters of space to be self-sustainable. So you need that space to grow crops, to feed you. You need that space to grow um, crops to feed the animals. You need that space to install solar panels, to convert solar energy to electricity. You need to grow plants and then turn them into fuel to heat up your house. So that is a lot of space you need just to be self-sustainable, and that's not very efficient. Then I thought about my study system, which are organisms that are living on coral reefs, 
So what happens if we replace this house with the same size coral reef? How much additional space do we need to make this thing self-sustainable? Well, the answer is almost no additional space. You don't actually need any additional space to make this coral reef system self-sustainable. Why is that? Well, because they are doing sort of agriculture as well as we do, but instead of growing all their crops outside, they're actually growing their little agriculture inside themselves. Right, so they form this really interesting ecological relationship termed photosymbiosis. It, it usually involves the photosynthetic microorganism, or the symbionts, living inside the heterotrophic host. So it's a mutualism where the symbionts performing all the photosynthesis, giving organic carbon or sugar to the host, and then the host in return giving back a shelter, and they basically fertilize the symbionts, giving them nitrogen and phosphor, other inorganic nutrients. Right, so this relationship allow, well, it supplements about 90% of the coral's nutritional needs, and that's why they can survive in this very nutrient-poor uh, environments in the open ocean. And not only they flourish themselves, they build skeletons and structures so they can support this huge diversity there. So coral reefs might be, one, like coral animals might be one of the most um, famous example for photosymbiosis. But doesn't, that doesn't mean that photosymbiosis is only restricted in corals. Actually, it's not even an ecological exception. I would argue that in certain habitats, photosymbiosis is the norm. So for example, if we're looking at a biodiversity survey of the open ocean, right? So if you pay attention, some of the, in some of the size frequencies, like in this meso size organisms, the abundance, the number of photosymbiotic hosts here actually far outweighs the abundance of heterotrophic protists or metazoar animals or even phototrophic protists. So in certain system, photosymbiosis is really abundant. And it's not only abundant, it's also evolutionary diverse. So there's a tree of life for eukaryotes. For every lineage here that I label with a dot, there are some members in this lineage that has independently evolved photosymbiosis of some sort. Sometimes it's two different single-celled organisms having symbiosis together. Sometimes it's multicellular organisms like fungi, algae living together, think about lichens. And sometimes they're in animals, right? There's jellyfish, corals, anemones, clams that are performing these kind of photosymbiosis, right? And because the prevalence and diversity of photosymbiosis is a really interesting system for asking evolutionary questions. We could ask a lot of questions about evolutionary adaptation. What kind of adaptation have evolved for them to uh, con conduct photosymbiosis, right? We can ask them what happened with the lineages, and we can also compare among diverse lineages. And when I talk about adaptation, we can think about them at different levels. You can look at morphological level, ecological level, even at the genomic level, right? And we can ask questions like, do they have innovations? Are there evolution of novel genes? Or do they pull up existing functions from their ancestors and reutilize there to adapt to photosynthesis, right? So here are all the questions we can ask. And for today's talk, I'm going to use uh, one group of organisms to answer some of this, and that's um, bivalves or clams. Right, marine clams. So before I go into the questions, like, uh, let's take a look at the evolution of photosymbiosis in bivalves. So in living bivalves, so not including the extinct ones, there are two lineages that independently evolved photosymbiosis or obligate photosymbiosis. So one of them is the giant clams. Those are might be more familiar to you guys. They're big, colorful mantles, very popular <laughs> among aquarium hobbyists. And then the other group, we call them the hard cockles. So what's interesting about this group is that there are two clades in the, in the same subfamily, and one group is entirely photosymbiotic, and they have a sister group in the same subfamily that don't have any symbiotic association. So because of this, they provide a really good uh, um, system to conduct kind of comparative analysis. Right? So I'm gonna show you some more pictures of this group and so give you some idea about what they look like. So here's a hot, uh, heart cockle I collected, and if you cut it open, you can see different type of tissues. So here is what we call the mantle tissue of the clam and then the gills. And you can see these dark colors. They're not actually from the clam. They are from the algae that are living inside the clam. So they make these dark colors. And then we have the foot here, which is white and is largely symbiont free. 
So that's where the symbionts are distributed and internally they actually live in these tubular systems that derive from the host digestive system. So if we zoom in, so here are some slides of the gills of the plant. You can see this transparent tubular sort of structure going along with the gill. And all the purple dots you see here are the algae. And if you further zoom in, here are, is the individual tube. And you can see it's really packed with algae. And the symbionts belong to this family, Symbiodinesia. It's a very diverse dinoflagellate family. And they have members in this same family associating with corals, jellyfish, foraminifera, and other type of host, right? So phragni, or the hard cockles, is actually ecologically pretty diverse. They have different habitat preferences and ecological preferences. So some of them are in funnel, so they kind of bury themselves in the sediment. On the right, you can see a, a live animal here. So this is the little uh, mantle part that is actually exposed to the sun, and the rest of animal are actually buried in the sediment. And then some of them like epifaunal lifestyle. So they're sitting on top of sediments like this guy. It's not uh, buried at all. So here's a live photo of this particular species. It's like to sit on top of a sediment exposed to the sun. And then some of them actually prefer deeper or kind of <laughs> less um, light intense habitat. So they can live in largons that are about 10, 20 meters deep, which is pretty deep consider that they actually need a sign to do photosynthesis, right? And others, like other photosymbiotic organisms, prefer shallow habitat. They live on these reef flats, sometimes could be intertidal, right? So because we have these diverse habitat preferences, it's very obvious that the light intensity and availability in these habitats differ. So because of that, we could actually ask questions like how does light availability actually impact their morphological adaptation? Right, think about the clams, they inherently have hard shells that close up and they're opaque, but then now they have this problem, they have to expose themselves to sun and get sun penetrate their shells and give them to the algae, right? So how does that impact their morphological adaptation? We can also ask question about how does this different light uh, availability impact the nutrient acquisition within the symbiosis, which is the core <laughs> essence of the symbiosis, right? It's a nutrient exchange. But if you don't get enough light or you get too much light, how does that impact the nutrient acquisition? So first I'm gonna tell some stories about that. And then the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit of how we take advantage of this habitat variation and use that to help us understand some of the genomic basis of photosymbiosis. Okay, so we'll start briefly with the morphological side. So again, let's go back to our phylogeny. If you remember, we had this group. One group is photosymbiotic, one group is not. So we wanted to assess what is the shell shape variation within the entire subfamily, and how is that correlated with habitat specialization within this group? So we were lucky enough to collect enough um, species for both non-symbiotic and symbiotic lineages and then we can classify them into different sort of ecological groups. So we have one group, both not symbiotic and symbiotic, that live in deeper habitats, and they bury themselves in the sediment, right? So this group has the least light availability. And then we have a middle group where they're photosymbiotic, they live in shallow habitat, but they bury themselves in the sediment. And then lastly, we have the very light intense group where they live in very shallow habitat, and they're also entirely exposed to the sun. So because we can take a look at the morphological change around these groups, we use micro CT scanning to basically scan many, many different species, individuals, and we have a model of their shell. And then we can use 3D morphometrics to play semi-landmarks and landmarks on their shell, basically capture the variation of the entire valve of the bivalve. And then we can superimpose them and compare variation across different species and individuals, okay? So I'm gonna show a little really simple preliminary results on a few species. So this is just a really simple PC analysis looking at variation within this group. And you can already see that PC1 is explaining 80% of the shell variation basically. So what is PC1? So each of these clusters um, correspond to a species. So firstly, on the far right side, we have the species right here, which is non-symbiotic and live in pretty deep environment, 20 to 50 meters deep in the ocean. And then we have this group of species that lives in kind of shallow area and they're photosymbiotic, 
but they bury themselves in the sediment. So get, they get some level of light exposure, more than this guys, but not as much. And then we have this kind of extreme species, which is symbiotic, and it's really constantly exposed to the sun. So from this even initial analysis, you can already see that large amount of the shell variation kind of is associated with habitat specialty or light availability here, right? So how do they change? So perhaps it's easier if I actually show you some photos of the claims. Okay, so I start from the beginning. So this is the non-symbiotic, two of the non-symbiotic species from South America, I think. So they live in deep habitats. They don't bury, uh, they bury themselves in the sand. And you can see they look like kind of normal plants that you usually see. Their shells are convex, they're kind of fat and round. And then we have the second species example. So this is a photosymbiotic species, but it lives in a deeper habitat, 20 meters, around 20 meters, and then it's buried in the sediment. And just looking at the shell morphology, it's not that different from the non-symbiotic species. So it has relatively symmetric shell, the shells are convex, they're kind of fat. And then we go into these more specialized species. So here are two species. Again, these are simple symbiotic species living in shallow areas, I and mean, they still bury themselves in the sediment. And you can start it to see really development of asymmetry in their shells. So on this side, we call the anterior side, it's, it's convex, you can see this curve here. But on the posterior side, which is the side they're actually facing the, the sun, it's largely flattened on this side for both species, right? If you compare them to the deeper species. So there's a certain degree of flattening on their posterior side. And then lastly, if we look at that extreme species I showed before, you can see very, very flattened posterior side to the point that you can't even see it from this view, right? So if you take the two valves and close them together, they look like this. So they're very flat to the extent that some people call them living solar panels. So these species really maximize their surface to volume ratio, presumably getting maximum light intensity for their algae. And not only that, their shells also develop microstructures where we call windows, where light could actually penetrate even the shells are closed. Right, so it's just from the preliminary quantitative analysis and just looking at these shells, we can, we can infer that this habitat level a difference is actually correlated with different degrees of shell flattening. It might have an impact of how the, the shell adaptation to this interesting lifestyle, right? So that then begs the next question. <laughs> if these different clams are really living in these light gradients, some are getting lots of sunlight and some are not, do they actually rely on their photosymbionts to the same degree, right? Because the photosymbionts have to perform photosynthesis and giving sugar to them. If they're not getting a lot of light, do they actually help the host, right? So in order to answer that question, we need to collect some species that share similar ecological uh, habitat, but just diff that are different in their light um, preferences, right? So to do that, we picked three representative species from Guam. They live close to each other, but at different depths. So we have two species here, fragment, fragment, whitely eye, one is big, one is small that they live, they coexist in this kind of really flat, really shallow. I'm talking about intertidal level shallow, <laughs> they're really shallow. And then we have Fragum suizans that live close by to these two species, but actually in a lagoon. So that's about five to 10 meters, right? So they differ in their habitat depth. So the question is, do they actually rely on photosymbiosis to the same degree? So I just wanna show you some uh, of the habitat we are at. So this is the habitat for the shallow species. You can get there by snorkeling. You just go in there and it's fairly bright, right? And we have like an old spaghetti strainer. <laughs> we just swim around and use it to sieve through the sand. They're actually very shallow, shallowly buried. If you're lucky, you scoop it up and then you can sieve through and you can actually catch these bivalves in there. So here are the two species. Big one is right here. Here are the smaller ones. You can have many, many of them. Right, so that's the shallow habitat we have. And the next is our Fragum suizans living in a deeper habitat. And you can see it's much darker, and then we have to get there by diving. We have to make a much bigger sieve because a lot of times we don't even know what we're looking at. It's too dark. We're just diving through and then come out and count if we get anything. Right, so that's how different these two habitats are. 
So how do we figure out how much carbon they're getting from their photosymbionts, right? But luckily, for this group, we can actually look at their isotope signatures and then determine how much of their carbon source is coming from their symbionts versus filter feeding. So for a symbiotic plant, at least for this group, they haven't lost their ability to acquire food from the environment. So they still have their gills. They can still perform some level of heterotrophic feeding. So there are two options, right? One option is you can do your heterotrophic feeding and eat phytoplankton. So if you do that, this photosynthetic phytoplankton uses this special enzyme, Rubisco, to catalyze their photosynthesis, right? And this enzyme has a property where it catalyzes C12 a little bit faster than C13. So if your carbon source is coming from filter feeding, you're going to be C13 depleted if you, all your sources are coming from heterotrophic feeding. Right? The second option is you entirely rely on photosymbiosis then your carbon source are coming from the symbionts from the family Symbiotinaceae, right? But luckily for us, this group of algae have a different type of rubisco called type two. It actually discriminate less against the C13. So if all your carbon sources are coming from this way, you're going to be relatively C13 enriched compared to this way. So you can imagine all kinds of combinations between these two feeding streams, but at least we have these two extremes to look at, right? So to look at the C13 level of these species, we have some standard. So we use delta C13 to indicate their C13 depleted or enriched, right? We don't have to worry too much about this. But the bottom line is, if you're completely heterotrophic doing filter feeding, your delta C13 is around minus 24 or 22, is in that range. But if you're completely or largely relying on photosymbiosis, like giant clams, your delta C13 is gonna be around minus 16. So we have this range, and then we can measure that for our study system and see where they fall in that range and for how much they rely on photosymbiosis. Right, so we did that, and these are our three different species, and we can see that, yes, there's actually differences in their carbon isotope signature. So for these shallow species, those two are living together, their delta C13 largely are consistent with the giant clam, which really largely rely on photosymbiosis, right? It's around minus 16 or 16 or something. They fall in the same group. But for the deeper species right here, you can see that the delta C13 or isotope signature is between the entirely halotrophic host and the entirely photosymbiotic host. So this species from isotope signature at least is partially relying on photosymbiosis and partially relying on heterotrophic feeding. It kind of makes sense because they live in a deeper environment. They don't actually get that much light, right? So from this, we can see that the shallow species largely rely on their symbiotic algae, but the species that's adapted to the deeper habitats relying partially on photosymbiosis. So light availability actually has an impact on the ecology, on the actual association between the host and their symbionts. Right, so now that we know that light availability actually impacts the ecology of the diverse species quite a lot, my next question is, so how can we use that to help us understand the genetic background or genetic mechanism behind photosymbiosis, right? So before I do that, I wanted to try to maybe just get a preliminary sense about what kind of genes are actually involved in photosymbiosis, even though we might not be able to confirm their functions, right? So we go back again to our phylogeny, and luckily for us, we have these two independent origin of photosymbiosis, and then we have a group right here that is not photosymbiotic, but sister to the photosymbiotic species. Then we have this entire group here in the same family, call them outgroup or something, they're not photosymbiotic, right? So we have two groups here that we can use are not symbiotic and two groups that are symbiotic. So my initial thought is, okay, let's look at what genes are actually expressed and shared among these two independent origins, but they're not found in any of these non-symbiotic species. And if they're uniquely shared, maybe there's a hint that they're actually involved in this photosymbiotic ecology. So that's what we did as an initial filter. We sequenced the transcriptome of these 26 different cockle species including multiple hard cockles and multiple giant clams. And then we did the standard RNA-seq process. We extracted mRNA, 
sequenced them, and then we did a canola assembly for all these different species. And then we did an initial filter. So first of all, we found all the expressed genes that are shared by 100% of the heart cockles. And so just a diagram showing it. So, so imagine this blue is all the genes that are shared by all the heart cockles. And then we found all the genes that are shared by 100% of the giant clam, different giant clam species, right? And then we found the intersect of these genes. So these genes in the middle are 100% shared among the two photosymbiotic groups. And then we look at this and we annotate the gene, look at their functions, aligning with the non-symbiotic groups. Then we subtract a fair amount that are also expressed in the non-symbiotic cockles. And then we have this tiny subset left, and that's about 180 <laughs> something gene, there's still a lot, right? That's uniquely shared among the photosymbiotic groups, but not find, found in the non-symbiotic groups at all. So from that, we can sort of infer like maybe the, some candidates in this 180 are involved in photosymbiosis. And admittedly, a large amount of them, maybe like 60, 70% of them, their functions are unknown. When we're trying to annotate them, it's just like unknown function. We don't know what they're doing. But we do have this 40% lab that we know their function, so I'm gonna give you a few examples. So one of the examples we found are highly expressed only in the photosymbiotic bival, in only in their tissues that are involved in photosymbiosis is a digestive enzyme, the amylase. So this enzyme is used to catalyze the hydrolysis of starch into sugars. So if you think about the nutritional mutualism, right, the algae is giving sugar to their host. So we thought, okay, maybe this is possibly for acquiring additional sugar from their symbionts because you're digesting their starch, right? So that's one example. Another example is the cell division control protein. We think, well, maybe it's possibly used to regulating the algae growth in the host cells because you don't want them to continue to multiply and overtake the host, right? So these are just some examples and keep them in mind, right? We have hint that they might be involved in photosynthesis, but we don't really have definitive <laughs> support about what they're doing. So how can we find other lines of evidence to demonstrate function of these genes? Well, that brings our t us to the dark side. <laughs> well, the good thing about photosymbiosis is that the symbionts are highly relying on light, right? So it's almost like a switch. I can turn on the light, I can turn on photosymbiosis. I can turn off the light, and if there's no light, there's no photosynthesis, then there's no photosymbiosis, right? So we have this ecological factor that we can control and ma manipulate, so we can actually manipulate the activity of the symbionts and the host. And then maybe we will look at gene expression in response to turning on and off photosymbiosis. And that will give us another hint about which genes are involved, right? So for that, we actually need to do some field experiments. So we went back to our hard cockles, which are nicely uh, grouped into these two groups. So we have comparative system again, right? So to do that, we go back to our three species in Guam, two in shallow, one in deep. And then for this experiment, we added a fourth species from Panama, so this is a non-symbiotic species. We collected in a similar habitat, intertidal shallow habitat in Panama, and we have these four groups, two shallow, one deep, and one non-symbiotic, and we subject them to the same experiment for two weeks, turning on and off photosymbiosis, and see how their gene expression level change. Right, and by the way, when we were in Panama, we saw some other organisms that have symbiotic algae living on them. I don't know what they're doing <laughs> with the sloths and what kind of nutritional benefit is getting from there, but apparently these things are whole specific. Anyways, vertebrates aside, <laughs> here is our experiment. So for all four species, we subject them to three treatments for two weeks. So treatment A basically is normal light. So we put them in the tank, expose them to the ambient light kind of similar to what they will get in their natural environment. And then treatment B, we have a reduced light treatment. We cover this thing with a tarp, and then we measure the photosynthetic active radiation to make sure it's around half of the light they're getting compared to their natural, natural habitat. And then lastly, we have this cruel, <laughs> dark side of treatment where we just cover the tank. And these poor clams are just sitting in the dark for two weeks <laughs> with no light. Right? So basically, normal photosymbiosis, reduced photosynthesis, and then no photosynthesis. So after two weeks, we collect two different tissue types from 
all four species, the mantle and the foot. So if you remember my slides earlier, the mantle is the tissue where symbionts live, and the foot is where there's no symbionts. And of course, for the non-symbiotic species, both tissue types have no algae. So we did that, and then again, we did RNA-seq and look at the gene uh, expression patterns for these guys, right? We uh, do the mix de novo assembly. We filtered out all the algae <laughs> genes because they're part of the mix. So we had to filter them out, and then we got these uni genes that kind of represent gene expression from the host. And this just to show you that our transcriptome for all the species are around 90% complete. So it's a pretty good data set. And then for this talk, I'm going to focus a bit more on carbon and nitrogen metabolism and our, some examples, our discoveries here, right? Because these are essential for the photosymbiosis to happen. That's the nutrient they're exchanging in there. So how do we decide if a gene is actually involved in photosymbiosis? Well, I have this set of criteria. Okay, so first of all, if a gene is involved, potentially involved in photosymbiosis, it needs to have differential expression in the foot and mantle for the symbiotic species, at least, right? So it should be highly expressed in these tissues where the symbionts live, and it shouldn't be really highly expressed in this kind of tissue where there's no symbionts. Okay, that's the first criteria. The second criteria is that their expression level should be somewhat correlated with the light treatment we give them. So if they're really involved in nutrient exchange or photosymbiosis, when the light level is normal, the gene should be highly expressed. When you reduce the light, expression should be decreasing as well. And then finally, in the dark, this gene should have a low expression level because there's really no photosynthesis going on, not much nutrient exchange. So that's the second criteria. And then the third criteria is it should really <laughs> not be expressed in the tissues of the non-symbiotic species or if it's expressed, it shouldn't show a very clear pattern that following the light gradients, right? So it's not something that's just, you know, following the daily rhythm or daylight cycle. That would not be an indicator of a photosymbiotic gene, okay? So we have these three criteria. We applied it to our gene data set, and we found dozens of candidates for both carbon and nitrogen metabolism. And they're very interesting. I'm gonna only going to show you a few examples for time's sake. So what is the first gene that we found that exactly following this cycle? It's the amylase, remember? So that's the gene that we found from the initial filtering that's shared between symbiotic species. So the expression of this gene, I'm showing two examples. So Isians is the deep symbiotic species, Wiley is the shallow one. And you can see that in the mantle tissue, the expression of this gene is high in the normal light, decreases in the reduced light, and in the dark, it has the lowest expression. So those nice gradient for both symbiotic species, uh, in the foot tissue, there is no expression of this gene. Then what about the non-symbiotic species? Well, in the mental tissue, very low expression. Again, in the foot, well, the, this y-axis is now <laughs> scaled. But yeah, there's a low expression of MLS in the foot tissue. There are some, but it does not follow a gradient at all. So this gene is really um, meeting all our criteria for being important in photosymbiosis. And it's very exciting that we have these two different lines of evidence supporting amylase being an important gene in somehow in the carbon metabolism in this group. And it's also interesting because conventional idea is that symbionts in corals and other organisms are actually exporting small molecules like sugar or glycerol directly to the host. I haven't found any literature saying that the host is actually actively digesting starch, right, in the symbionts. We know that in free-living state, these symbionts can store their excessive sugar in the form of starch, but nobody knows that the host is constantly expressing amylase to actually break them down. So why are they doing that? I couldn't find any hint about what's the importance of this. And then, so I turned to the terrestrial plant literature because photosynthesis is really well studied in there. So it turns out in a plant, if you're removing some of the carbohydrate sinks, such as fruits, right, if you remove them and you allow sugar to build up in these photosynthetic tissues, like leaves, it actually really decreases photosynthesis rate. So excessive sugar is actually a signal that downregulates photosynthesis. So then we found this literature, like in free-living algae, if you actually remove the carbohydrate from the culture, 
you constantly remove the sugar that we produce, it enhances their photosynthesis rate. So the amount of sugar in photosynthetic tissue is actually a signal for the symbionts to up or down regulate photosynthesis. If there's too much, they're gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna shut down photosynthesis, I don't need that much. Right, so from these lines of evidence, we think that what's happening is in this animal photosymbiotic system, the host itself is actually acting as carbon hydrate sinks. It's constantly removing sugar, and as soon as the algae is building up excessive sugar in starch, it digests it. It just basically says, don't store any <laughs> excessive sugar for yourself, give them all to me. Right, so that's one of the interesting mechanisms we, we kind of uh, revealed from this comparative gene expression analysis. So I know I'm making the whole sounds like jerks. <laughs> They're just like constantly milking sugar out of thin bands, but this is a mutualistic interaction. So the next example is gonna be something that the host is doing that's nice for the symbionts, right? So this is another gene that we found that has a, met our criteria for photosymbiotic related genes. So this is carbonic hydrogen, hydrogenous. <laughs> so in the marine environment, right, if you wanna do a lot of photosynthesis, you actually need a lot of CO2, but CO2 concentration in the seawater is not that high. So this enzyme is actually catalyzing, so converting bicarbonate to CO2. And it has been found that in both corals and giant clams, this enzyme is expressed around the area where the symbionts live. So it's actually constantly trying to concentrate CO2 for their symbionts, right? But they're different species than what we're studying. So what do we see that in our group? So again, so for CA, you see these nice gradients for both symbiotic species that in their mental tissue where the symbionts live, they follow the light and the dark side <laughs> of the force. And then in the foot, they're either lowly expressed or not expressed at all. And we also look at our non-symbiotic species, we cannot detect expression of this gene in either the foot or mental tissues. So again, this is an independent line of evidence saying that there's no mechanism also existed in our bivalve systems where it's potentially used as a carbon concentrating mechanism to assist photosynthesis in the algae, okay? So here are some things we can reveal, like novel functions we didn't know existed before. We know they're happening now in our system. We can also use our method to maybe answer some existing questions. Okay, so let's move to the nitrogen metabolism a little bit. So for a long time, there's a lot of debate in the photosymbiotic world about what happens with nitrogen, right? Because they live in this nutrient poor area. If you wanna do agriculture inside yourself, you kind of have to fertilize your, your agriculture, your algae, right? So you need to pass nitrogen. So who is doing the nitrogen assimilation in this system? There's a lot of different studies saying, no, it's the symbiont. The algae itself is taking all the ammonium from the water and then assimilate nitrogen, and then some say, no, it's the host. It happened in the gill of the host. It happened on the other side. The host is taking on ammonia. Because usually for a heterotrophic animal, right, what they do is they excrete their ammonia. They don't take it in. But for the photosymbiotic organism, there's argument about, no, they're actually taking them in and passing them to the algae. So who is doing it? Well, if you're thinking about nitrogen assimilation, this is kind of the nitrogen assimilation cycle where ammonia is turned into amino acids basically by these two important enzymes, GS and GoGet. So we can find those genes in our data set and look at their expression pattern. Do they fit our criteria? So we look at that in both symbionts and yeah, in the host. And again, this uh, y-axis is gene expression level. And we can see, first of all, for the symbionts, yes, both enzyme genes that code these two enzymes, their expression follow our light gradients. In normal light, they're high, and in dark, their expression decreases significantly. But we also say, see the same thing in the host for both enzymes. In their mental tissue where the symbionts live, right, they follow the gradients. In normal light, they're high, and then in dark, they are low. And then again, in the foot tissues, we can't detect expression of those two, the genes that code those two enzymes. So again, they actually fit our prediction that these two genes are involved in photosymbiosis. And then our answer is actually both. Both the symbiont and the host are actively assimilating ammonia from the water column and supporting photosymbiosis, okay? And not only that, they assimilate that. And like I said before, the host itself also generates ammonium. And in other systems, they're considered waste, right? They're exported out of the animal. But within our photosymbiotic system, we can see that for, so this is the symbiotic one, right? 
the gene that codes ammonia transporter actually follow this gradient as well. So it's probably involved in photosymbiosis. It's possible that host is actually transporting their ammonium, excessive ammonium to the host as another type of fertilizer. And then if we're looking at a non-symbiotic species, this transporter is slowly expressed in the mantle and expressed somewhat in the foot, but not following any gradient. So we're thinking, well, in these non-symbiotic species, they're probably using the transporter just to get rid of ammonium, which is very different pattern than what we see in the photosymbiotic species, right? So there's another line of evidence that the host is really trying to fertilize and help the symbionts to proliferate. Okay, so hopefully with these examples, I demonstrate that this kind of comparative gene expression analysis using light gradients or manipulation can really um, reveal important genetic mechanisms of photosymbiosis, right? And then go back to our old question, what are they doing with their genomic mechanisms? Is it innovation? Is it coexisting functions? So the, all the examples I gave you before is a lot of and following this category, right? They're co-opting existing enzymes and expressing them in different parts of the tissue, regulating their expression levels to facilitate photosymbiosis. But remember, we do have, you know, this uh, amount is 180, <laughs> I'm saying like 60%, we do know their function. So there's high chance that there's also a lot of innovation going on in the system. We just currently don't have a lot of ways to assess that yet. Okay. So for this whole time, I've been talking about host, make me a very host-centric person. So now I'm gonna spend the last few five minutes or something, talk a little bit about symbionts. So what's going on with symbionts? We care about the whole system, so we wanna know what happens in the algae. Okay, so before we know anything about <laughs> what the algae is doing in the dark and light cycle, we actually need to figure out who they are. Okay, so within the hard cockles and giant clams, these symbionts actually belong to this particular genus, Glelocopium. It's one of the really I think most diverse genus within the family Symbiogenesiae, and it has a lot of different hosts like corals, forums, jellyfish, etc. Right, so we know that they, their symbionts, the symbionts that belong to this genus, but are they different in hosts that occupying shallow or deep habitats? We don't actually know that. So in order to figure that out, we did some amplicon sequencing on the ITS marker for this group. So we find out, it's kind of surprising to me, it's like it's first, yes, the deep host and the shallow host actually host different symbiont compositions. So this is a deep species, so each of them is an individual host and then the bar is showing symbiont compositions, different colors in meaning different strains. But not only that the deep species is consistently showing different composition of symbionts, but between the two shallow species, they live side by side symmetrically they actually have different symbiont composition as well. And it appears to be there is one blue symbiont lineage that can be found in all three species. It might be a host generalist. And then we have this specialist, like the green ones are only found in the deep species. Yellow one is only found in fragment fragum. And then the red one are only found in white lii. So even some of the symbionts are really appear to be host specific. So do they contribute then to the differential gene expression within photosymbiosis under different light conditions, right? So we did initial assessment, just looking at the overall gene expression of the symbionts in the photosymbiosis, and then what we see is they actually are different. So here's an example of fragum fragum. This is just overall gene expression similarity matrix, and you can see there are two clear clusters one group is here, and then the other group have a very different gene expression pattern compared to the other. And if you actually go back and look at these individuals, where do the symbionts come from? So these symbionts actually come from individuals that are only hosting these yellow strings. And then the other cluster are coming from individuals that are hosting these blue strings. And similarly, for white lii, right, we have these, again, two clusters, and then we match them back to their host origin, and you can see that two clusters correspond to individuals that are mostly hosting blue and individuals mostly hosting red. So not only the hosts are hosting different types of symbionts, and the symbiont gene expression are actually different when you give them dark and light treatment. Right? So that indicates that the symbionts probably play a very important role of the adaptation of the host in different light gradients as well. 
and then we have a lot more questions to ask after that, right? So, and then we also put the host, so the symbiont identity in a larger phylogenetic framework, comparing them from host, the symbionts from other hosts. Right? So what we see is that these are our four strains. They're actually clustered with symbionts found in benthic foraminifera and worms. And then in this purple, purple clade here, you see these are largely symbionts found in corals, anemones, and other things. So even on the symbiont level, you seem to see a separation of things that live inside hosts that are buried in the sediment, like they're benthic. And then you have symbionts that are associated with corals and anemones that are more out in the open ocean, which are getting more light. So there's a hint that even the symbionts having, are having certain levels of habitat or host special uh, preferences there. Right, so yeah, the take home message for the symbiont side is that three different fragment species really have different symbiont compositions and the symbionts may also be correlated with either habitat differences or light levels, okay? So hopefully with all these different stories, I've convinced you that the light availability or variability can potentially impact evolution of the host shell morphology it actually determines the host's different levels of dependency on their photosymbiosis. And by manipulating lights, turning symbiosis off and on, we can use that as an important tool to detect and test gene functions. And then this light availability also possibly impacts symbiont composition and gene expression in this group. So overall, this habitat and light special preferences can be a really important driver for photosymbiotic system diversification, whether we're talking about morphology, ecology, or at the genomic level. And the Dust Raider is holding my cockle, sitting in my office. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank uh, collaborators, Dr. Colin Limmer, so really helpful in our field work in Panama and Guang, and my student Dan and Richie for doing a lot of the field work analysis, and my postdoc Viri for working on the algae side of things, and lots of different museums that help us with samples and my funding sources. And then I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the lecture session in the audience. I will also uh, conclude the session. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I've got a quick question if, if there was any right away. Can you go back to the symbiont breakdown for each of the compounds? This one? Yes. Yeah. This Regan uh, Frienzo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, uh, was that five different individuals? Yes. And were they sampled in the same place? They are in the same locality, yeah. Uh, and uh, all these individuals are from the same locality and similar are these, so there's no geographic differences among individuals. Okay. Um, but it's uh, kind of interesting. I mean, not long are none of them uh, monotypic, right? They have yeah, they all have two s s strings, and the but composition are similar. It's almost exactly the same ratio. How, how do you do that? <laughs> 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 One thing is that I wouldn't take the abundance of the ITS sampling consequencing very seriously right. because there's the PCR amplification error and all that. So I wouldn't say this reflects exactly the composition of symbionts in the host. But on the other hand, they, are, they do look very consistent. So I'm not entirely sure where the, why the two strains are maintaining possibly the same well, ratio. Not even that, but I mean, the tiny yellow thing is roughly the same size in all of them, the tiny oh, pink over here. Yeah. and the tiny blue. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, it looks monotonal almost, but it's a complex chamber. Yes, and it's striking. I it's very striking. Yeah. And those little things, I would not be confident that they're actually different strings, because for ITS, there's a lot of intragenomic variation. So they could represent that as well. So I'm only looking at the dominant strains. Yeah. And then we, I didn't show the expression for suizians, but we do have similar evidence that within fragment suizians, their gene expression level are very homogeneous across individuals, unlike the ones I showed before. For the other two species, you can actually see clear clusters of gene expression pattern. For suizians, you don't. They're all the same. Yeah. Look at the chat too if somebody can. Is there a good connection?
Yeah, um, Jing Chun, I just put a question in the chat. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, I was curious following on Dearman's question, mm -hmm. do the symbionts ever move from host to host, from um, shell to shell or in the same habitat or do hosts, are, are they ever trying to exchange symbionts? For example, <laughs> I mean, I'm wondering whether either partner is, you know, testing out different combinations. That's a really good question. From my limited observation of the anatomy of the bivalve, it seems like the symbionts really don't have a lot of way to get out of the host mm -hmm. unless the, because they're stemmed from the stomach, basically from the host, and it goes into the mantle and other tissues of the host, so it's a dead end. So unless they go back to the stomach and then go back to the mouth of the host, or the host like excrete them out for feces, there's not a lot of good ways for them to come out. So my guess is there might be levels of symbiont dispersal, limited level of symbiont dispersal from the host, but not a lot. And I don't know if they actually exchange symbionts. That's a good mm -hmm. question. We have to find ways to track the different lineages. And right now, they're morphologically very similar. So we can't even separate them out from the same host. But yeah, something really interesting to think about. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so the question is whether the symbiont composition change uh, will change through time or different life stages or ecological factors throughout the life history or of the host, right? So for this set of data, these individuals are killed <laughs> at different times of the experiment. So some are killed at the light time, some are killed in the dark across a few days. So at least on that level of variability, we don't see, at least from this data, a huge change of the symbiont community. I'm not entirely sure if I collect them a year later, would that change? My guess is it might, because they're uptaking symbionts from the sediment, and the symbiont composition in the sediment probably will change due to ocean wave and other things. So we might see change, but that's a good question. If we sequence them again in a different time scale, we might see changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. And I wonder if you also pull in data on actual cell cultures. So is there a different um, yes. yeah. acceleration or even shallow movement? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is we look at the shell morphology change according to habitat or light availability. Do we look at um, shell depth and thickness of these individuals? Like, yes, we do. We actually measure that. I didn't show the data here. But if we go back to our pictures, you can kind of see it with your naked eye. So the non-symbiotic species, their shells are pretty thick and opaque. The light, I mean, I actually try to shine light through the <laughs> shells, and I can't see light, much light passing through. And then here is the symbiotic species living in deep habitat, and I say that, oh, their morphology are similar to the non-symbiotic ones, but the shells are actually a lot more thinner if you look at the actual species. And I try to shine light through it, it actually illuminates the shell, so there's certain level of light passing through these individuals. And then when you're looking at the shallow barrier species, so these species, not this one, but this one actually also possess shell windows. So these little microstructures that allow light to penetrate. And then of course, compared to this one, this one maybe is easier. You can see the contrast between maybe the dark spots and the white spots. So any of these dark spots are windows. So this is the thinnest individual species across them and they have the most number of windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but these are mostly just 
color and pigment variations, and these are actually microstructure variations. So pretty different, yeah. Thanks. So the question is, what do these organisms, what are their roles in their ecosystem? And the answer is it depends, <laughs> depending on the species and which ecosystem you're looking at, their abundance and their distribution shift a lot. But the question about what environmental factors or how the environmental factors shifts might impact their ecology, there's a lot of interesting thoughts. I've th thought about that because, you know, this photosymbiotic system really thrives in nutrient-poor environment. So what happens if you increase environmental nitrogen, for example? For them, there are these nutrient runoffs, right? Even in Guam, <laughs> they're getting enriched in nitrogen. And if the symbionts are actually getting outside nitrogen from the environment, not from the host, what are they going to do? Are they going to explode and then just leave and disrupt the photosymbiosis? And our initial assessment is, I think it does. It does disrupt the photosymbiosis. If you let the algae have excessive nitrogen, their photosynthetic rate actually decreases, they grow more and then they overshade each other and then they lower their photosynthetic rates and that sometimes causes bleaching so they leave the host and we can see like um, lighter color and pigmentations in the host. So definitely I think environmental nitrogen and phosphor levels, light levels, carbon levels will all potentially impact the association. I get to back to your cell division control protein. <laughs> no question about that. Yes. Uh, there's not much, it's just a slice saying they're there. Right, I know, yeah. yeah. I, I, this is in your initial look at the threat genes in the photosymbiotic. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, this is controlling the cell division, you think, of the symbiont? That's my guess. It's used to control the division of the symbionts, not the host itself. But it's, it's a fossil gene. So is it, a, is it the same gene that's used for fossil cell control? <laughs> or is it a homolog or what's going on here? I mean, the answer is the homolog to human <laughs> and right. mammal cell division control proteins. That's how we annotate the genes. Right. So we're right. not entirely sure right. what exactly is the bival version of this. I mean, it is the animal gene. And in other system, model system, their role is to control cell division. So we don't know what they're doing. But you're going to find out, obviously. Uh, do, what, you, what you did would be very interesting to see if it, if it interferes with the uh, equivalent gene in, in a non symbiotic species. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can find homologs. That's what you said. You're going to reach into the nucleus. Well, thank you. If we have genomic data of them, because for the expression level data, a lot of times the genes are expressed in the photosymbiotic system, we just can't find them. They're not even expressed in certain tissues right. in the non-symbiotic data. But if we look at the genome and they have that same homolog, then we right. can assess that. Thank you. Any more questions? Good. I like um, questions. Yeah. And, uh, I'd like to thank you again for traveling. I'm probably running out of physical. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's great to be in person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you for the audience on Zoom for 